Hey, so we have returned and just a quick overview of today's work. I just got lost in the Zoom controls here. So we are in, we have built the stupa of our compassion alchemy uh, meditation system. We started long ago in September, I think it was with the earth element, um, which was all about learning to become calm. And if you remember that, we did like orientation exercises with the eyes to help bring you in the present moment and take the nervous system out of fight or flight overactivation. We did a lot of two, one breathing. We did a breath mantric technique that had us saying to ourselves, calm, and we learned to get calm. Um, and I suggested that that was the type and phase of meditation to work on the feeling of secure attachment um, or that sense of inner trust of support that we want to be that solid earth element. So just to have a box to kind of where all that stuff goes, there it is. Then we did our uh, water element. Let me put my stupa back up here. I liked that image. Hold on. Come on, stupa. Hang on, stupa. Stupa, hang on. You all remember that song, right? From what, 1962 or some nonsense. Okay. So then we did our water element, which was all about, in this system, all about consolidation. And it had to do with the developmental phase of when you are a young adult and you're actually building yourself an ego right? The earth element, the reason why attachment stuff is so intense sometimes is because at that phase, you don't have your own ego. You are your parents and caregivers and family of origin in a way. So it's not until we get to that water element that you start to develop your own ego. And in that, we did all the practices on um, developing reflective awareness, consolidating a self, and actually learning to watch the thoughts go round and round and not necessarily identifying with those as me. Uh, so that retreat, we did a lot of sitting and less talking. And then last time we did our fire element where I did uh, more talking than I wanted to, um, but we got some practice in that day too. And this was where we were developing the heart of compassion. Um, and in that we did some shadow work, we did some emotional alchemy, and this has to do in um, Erickson's model, which I'll bring back up in a sec, with um, the previous phase, which the challenge, let me see if I can go find that little document again. Uh, there it is. Just a sec. The developmental challenge to overcome in that fire element phase was the intimacy versus isolation, intimacy versus isolation. And so in this system, it's all about how to have a fully functioning, compassionate heart. Um, and so each of these in this system are, are sort of stacked atop one another so that you don't have to mis make, um, I don't know, it's a little harsh to call them errors, but um, ways of not setting yourself up great, where like I tried to go for ultimate universal compassion before I even knew I had attachment trauma. That sets you up for kind of more work later. You have to go back and do some cleanup. So if we had the sense of how the stupa is stacked up, uh, we can develop a lot of strength and stability in our meditation practice. Okay, then today we have grown. Wow, you have grown love and compassion. You've, you're now turning 41 <laughs> and you are ready to move into generativity versus stagnation. I don't know if you can see that on here, but generativity versus stagnation in Erickson's model. And once again, disclaimer, you know, there's other work that has expanded on or gotten rid of aspects of Erickson's model. We're just using it as a sort of a shorthand uh, for convenience sake. So for us, now I can bring back that other image. For us, we are uh, also just framing this or putting it in the bucket of the karma 
uh, Buddha family or the wind element, the wind element. And this has all to do with uh, action and creativity, action and creativity. So I think I introduced the um, the five C's for this compassion alchemy system, which the earth element is calm. The water element is curious. The fire element is compassionate. And this wind element is going to be creative, creative. So calm, curious, compassionate, and creative. Okay. So um, I borrowed the first three of those C's from uh, Rick Hansen, which if you haven't read Rick Hansen's stuff, highly recommend it. He wrote The Buddha's Brain uh, is the famous book. And then another um, audio set that I had, which is, I think is called The Enlightened Brain, uh, something along those lines. And he goes into um, the natural state of your mind when relaxed is calm, curious, and compassionate. This is like... This is what you have available. If we could figure out how to downregulate that nervous system, um, and this is sort of what meditation is all about, giving us the controls to how to tune the mind back to calm, curious, and compassionate. So then where this, it's, it's great to have um, scientists and researchers and psychologists chiming in about this because it does actually mirror what ancient meditation systems told us which is when you've become calm, curious, and compassionate, then you can become creative. Then you can be creative. Now, there are folks um, who will tell you that um, good art is only <laughs> produced out of massive suffering. Um, the mystics of the world have a slightly different opinion. And, and one example, a counter argument, which we don't need to do a debate about it, but like might be um, like Buddhist sacred art, for example. Um, these aren't necessarily tortured folks who are, you know, trying to break up with cocaine and their ex-girlfriend all at once. And that's when they wrote their hit song. No, they're painting spiritual iconography from a place that is calm and compassionate. Um, so what I want to offer you is the possibility that some of our most creative states actually come from being able to settle into that nature of mind, which is calm, curious, and compassionate. Um, one other quick example of this is the capacity to think outside the box, um, or you could say to think outside of false dichotomies. So um, one thing to know about your brain is that when it is stressed, you tend to fall into kind of tunnel vision. I mean, physically that happens to us when we're stressed and mentally as well. We tend to think, you know, oh, okay, it's either this solution or this solution. Ah, oh, geez, are you going to vote with the Republicans or the Democrats? Which one is it? And who are, and we want to fix things in these limited identities. We want to fix the possible strategies into limited strategies. Um, one of my lamas taught, and I have found that this is true in relationship counseling, often the big problems in intimate relationships come when strategies butt heads. You need to do the dishes right after dinner. I don't need to do the dishes at all. <laughs> you know, and they are, and the trick is if you could find one other option just one to break out of the false binary, the whole thing can open up from there. The minute your mediator says, well, what if y'all just started using the dishwasher? Oh, I never even thought about that. You know, in my house, mom, we had a dishwasher, but mom thought that meant you were lazy or bourgeois or something like that, you know? And then all of a sudden, you know, they go like, well, no, I don't want to do, use the dishwasher, but I'll do the dishes the next morning. And people will start populating all of these creative strategies, you know, or like in my house, how it goes, I hate, I hate doing the dishes. I really don't like doing them. So I just cook all the food. And then my partner doesn't mind doing all the dishes because I cooked all the food. Like it just happened to work out. But if we'd gotten stuck in whose job is it and who's a slob and who's not a slob, it could have ruined our marriage 
Yeah, you know. Um, so if you can get out of the false binary boom, and pick, find just one extra solution, it what's happening, why that works in intimate relationships is because it shifts your brain out of this rhetorical uh, fallacy land and into more of what your real nature is, which is this creative, intelligent, possibility generating machine. This is the good news about your mind is that you are a possibility generating machine. So super cool. And um, the way we're going to play with this is we will use the tools that we've uh, developed thus far, being able to settle the mind into calm, <sighs> getting curious and open, not fit, you know, hey, what's, what, what is it right now? Wow, weird getting compassionate. Oh, that's how it is. Well, I love it. However, you, you know, get, developing this inner Mr. Rogers or something. Um, and then from that place, right? <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad we're all on board with inner Mr. Rogers. Uh, it works for me. Um, from that place, then we think also in a very, hey, in a very Mr. Rogers move, we go like, well, what might we create? Do you want to create puppets? Do you want to, you know, do you want to create a community? Do you want to create connection? Like, what could we do? And um, it's really fun. So the phase we're in, and then we'll do a practice in a sec. Let me just finish this lecture. Um, but the phase from Erickson's is this generativity versus stagnation is the challenge that he says uh, people tend to face when they are 40s through 60s. It doesn't necessarily um, have to wait that long. Some people start to feel issues of like, what's my life purpose and what's my legacy earlier than that? And actually, um, I would guess that the um, Buddhist systems that start you with death meditation um, can catalyze these stages to come on earlier. Because generally, like um, the one that follows this, I forget exactly what it is, but it's it's basically like you're you're getting in touch with death, and what your life has been about is is like Erickson's final one he postulates, um, and then similarly the one like my my age group generativity versus stagnation is you're kind of thinking like what am I leaving the world, How, what am I giving my family, my friends, my my folk, you know, my planet, is this like what's my deal, so. If you were in a Buddhist tradition, they start you out meditating on death. That realization that the end is coming dawns on you sooner than 65. <laughs> it, it can dawn on you earlier. And that can be a good or bad, you know, uh, efficient or inefficient thing. Um, but in general, in that old model from Erickson, it takes about this long. And this has been my experience as well, now being 45 is that to get through that, like the intimacy thing and the trust thing and the self-love thing and the like enough skills to keep your car running and all like, it takes like 40 odd years to get that figured out for a lot of us. And then to create something to like, to be in, um, in our relationships with others with a sense of like, what could we create rather than hashing out like old karmas and traumas or something like that. So it doesn't, doesn't mean that you're going to get there by the time you're 45. Um, but Erickson sort of suggested that maybe that's the earliest you're realistically going to get there. Um, and just mystically, uh, one of my lamas just taught in one system, I think it's the Spanda system um, of yogis, they taught that until you're 40, basically you're working out the karma from your last life. And after 40 is where you are making the karma for your next life. <laughs> so this is similar, you know, whether that's true or not, if we think of these sort of as metaphorical contemplations, um, it, it sort of works that way that like four decades. And let's be honest in the ancient world, that was great grandparent age. Right. So you finished a life. If you've done four decades, you finished a whole life cycle. Right. Um, but even in our modern world, it kind of takes that time to have 
integrated as a whole person. And that's where we can really start to think about like, oh, what's purpose? What's legacy? What's creativity? So of course, these things all apply to when we're 20 and when we're 15 and et cetera. Um, but in terms of looking at how our meditative practice plays with different developmental tasks that we might incorporate, it's, it's nice to have a little map there. So the one thing I want to present to you before we do our next practice is the upset to agency continuum, the upset to agency continuum. So one of the things that we're going to be playing with, with creativity is, let's see, can I make a shape with this? Maybe. Hey, all right, we got it. Ba -ba. Okay, is that you have a continuum in your being, which on one end you have upset, and on the other end you have agency. So in a way, you could think that the more agentic you feel, the less upset you'll feel. And I'm using this term in a very specific way. It's actually a way to translate the Sanskrit word dukkha, which they usually translate as suffering. Um, upset meaning like off kilter, right? Like when, you know, oh, I just upset all the, all the items on the table. You know, they're, they're set off, they're falling down. <laughs> they're, they're not in the stupa orientation with the solid parts down below and the subtle pointy parts up above. So Basically, these are, what do they call it, in, in an inverse relationship to one another. The more agentic you feel, the less upset you'll feel. And similarly, the more upset you feel, the less agentic you will feel. The um, old Buddhist teaching on this comes from Master Shantideva and our current Dalai Lama likes to quote it, um, which says something along the lines of, if there's anything you can do about it, there's no point in worrying. And if there's nothing you can do about it, there's no point in worrying. So the notion is that the worry, the, the spinning your wheels is just, it's like burning up the fuel that we could be using in positive directions. And this is sort of the first clue we want to get in the art of creative meditation. Um, if you watch the news, what did one of the students call it? Um, negative emotional war stories, I think is what they said news stands for. Um, and I've gotten really bummed because I like to listen to like NPR and uh, kind of semi non-biased you can still find their biases but you know i still like it and it, it suits my liberal snowflake values pretty well um it's it goes with my biases but one thing i've been bummed about for the past number of years is that while the litany of bad news goes on and on and on almost never does anyone say and here's what to do about it like I would love a news show. So he here's what it is, you know, um, and social media is just, it's just as terrible, right? But if somebody said to me, oh, wow, Iran has this morality police thing going on. It really sucks. People are suffering. Here's the petition to sign for this. Here's the uh, person in your government that you could talk to, to talk to the UN, to take this specific action. Here's the petition you need to sign uh, about that action to the UN. The whole thing. So imagine that scenario, if you would, I don't know if, if uh, that you resonate with that one, but you know, if you heard, oh yeah, here's this terrible thing going on on the other side of the world. Here are the five steps you could take. We don't know if you're going to make that big a difference, but here's what you have to do because you have to at least try, right? It sucks, but it's not as bad as what we usually get, which is here's this terrible thing happening on the other side of the world. 
enjoy feeling like shit. Right. And then what they do, uh, cause they, they know this very well is then they cut to commercial and they give you something you can buy that will fill the void that has been created by sharing anti-agency. So what's weird is I don't know if people are doing it on purpose, um, <laughs> but how it has turned out is that most of our social media machine, most of our actual media machine is about generating upset with no solutions and reinforcing a sense of learned helplessness. Eek. Have you noticed, is that just me who noticed that? Or have you noticed that as well? Okay, cool. So I introduced this at the beginning because we have a tool and the tool is the agency to upset continuum <laughs> as a way to think about it. And we'll play with other tools with this, but this is, this is the creative meditation part. The rest of the time so far, there's been something that leads toward like engaged meditation or something like that, but it's mostly about been working on you, right? This is where we can start to use these tools about like, well, how do we stay sane and make change? You know, and uh, one philosophy would say, well, you can't actually be sane unless you're making positive, contributing to positive change. So the trick is that we want to constantly be on the lookout for what is mine to do. What is mine to do? And I'll put that in the chat box. Uh, if you're taking notes, you might want to have this here. What is mine to do? Um because this is the code word or the code mantra to navigate the upset to agency continuum. Just like Master Shantideva, right? Um, in Buddhism, a lot of time, we will get the second half. If there's nothing you can do about it, why worry, right? And this is valuable in on the meditation seat, right? The mind will be like, what about this? And you'll be like, mind, we've got 14 more minutes on the clock to meditate. Why are you thinking about that? Right. That's where you go like, okay. But then in the world, there's also, if there's something you can do about it, why worry? Because the, the idea is that you are meant to be doing something about it. So we want to find what is mine to do. Okay. And this relates, we'll, we'll play with this a little more and, and practices for that, but this relates to creative meditation which builds on the skill we've already learned, which is that you get to choose where you foreground your attention. You get to choose where you foreground your attention. So back in Earth Element, we were foregrounding calm, right? We were, hey, you could do it right now with me if you want. Think of anything or notice anything pleasant about your current situation. Like I'm noticing like this rain is just gorgeous outside in my current situation. And if it's a really hard to be pleasant, um, notice anything neutral. That's also just fine. And then just savor that, foreground that with your awareness. And it feels kind of good. You can fill up a little resource well with that. Okay, then in um, the water element, we began foregrounding presence itself, right? Oh, here's the contents of my consciousness. Here's, here's the consciousness itself. We were foregrounding awareness itself. Then in the fire element, we were foregrounding compassion. Here's all the various emotions. Here's the shadow stuff. We're foregrounding the compassionate heart. So in this wind element, what we want to foreground is agency. We want to foreground agency. And since we've learned that school skill, now we have a tool that we can use to navigate, you know, am I going to watch the news or not? Am I going to engage with social media or not? Those aren't necessarily the real questions. The real question is, am I foregrounding agency or not? So this is just a quick little introduction to our wind element. It's about generativity in our developmental stage. It's about creativity as a natural aspect of your being human. And it's about learning to foreground agency as a quick way 
out of dukkha, out of suffering and upset and worry and um, all the things that the uh, advertisers might like to foreground for you. Okay. Any talk back on that before we do a practice? No, simple. Okay. Let me just look at my notes here and make sure I'm not uh, missing something that was important. Doo, doo, doo. Oh, yes. Yeah. So if you wanted a C word, choice. Choice is another C word, right? So we're foregrounding agency or we're foregrounding choice because your mind constantly wants to know what choices it has, what should it choose. And um, this is an important aspect and of complete path of meditation, I believe, because most of our meditative disciplines are about finding choiceless awareness, dwelling in choicelessness, which is like a state of openness or emptiness. Um, but that's one half of our being. The other half is the part where we want to make good, empowered, compassionate choices. So the practice I would like to do with you is a practice of yoga nidra, like we did long, long ago. And um, we're going to incorporate the stupa aspect, but you can be lying down. So I'm going to be sitting up and you could do the sitting up if you want to, um, but feel free to lie down and go into deep relaxation. And what we'll do is we'll do the progressive relaxation. And then we want to kind of like we did in the stupa practice, go into foregrounding the sense of being and then noticing when the sense of doing comes up, right? Oh, is there anything I should be doing? Is there anything I'd like to be doing? This is what your mind will constantly populate. And what we want to do is rest back into being from doing. And we want to really get ourselves steeped in this choiceless awareness so that uh, we can cultivate empowered choosing. Are you ready? Let's do some practice. So please decide, choose whether you would like to lay down uh, and steepen this yoga nidra practice in that way, or whether you would like to do an upright sitting and maybe get some more of that stupa in. Either one will be good for its own reasons. <sighs> okay, feel free. Get a little drink of water like I needed to. Stretch out a minute if you needed to. Ooh. And I'll suggest a couple of stretches even. Uh, and these can be done if you've got enough room, at least, whether you're on the floor or in a chair, which is to put both arms above the head. And then you're just going to reach one as long as you can. Oh. And then if you're sitting up, you can't let it relax as completely as if you're lying down, but you just relax it. Oh. And then you take the other one and you reach up. So it's like doing, 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 doing with your arm. And then non-doing. And let them both come down. And then if it's available for you, you might want to take one leg and stretch. So I'm in a chair so I can do this. I'm going to stretch out that foot and just make it as long, 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 long leg as I can. Oh, oh, oh. Doing, 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 doing. And then drop it. And let's do the other one. Stretch it out. Long, 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 long. And then let it go. Okay, then finding your seat or your reclined position. In this one, I suggest your eyes be closed unless you or in a practice of keeping your eyes open for meditation. But since this one is about relaxing deeply, feel free to close your eyes. And with that sense of foregrounding awareness, let's begin to foreground our exhales for a few rounds.
and letting go of the focus on the breath. Obviously, you can keep breathing. We'll bring a sense of the inner smile of self-compassion or even the imagination or feeling that the universe is compassionate towards you, that like there's a force of blessing or thriving flowing to you. And then practicing our progressive relaxation, imagine above your head a sphere of golden light. And it carries the qualities of this warm and relaxing energy. And even any kind of nourishment that your body or mind might need. We'll then imagine that this golden light comes down and touches the crown of your head. And it begins to relax all the tissues in that area. Relaxes those cranial bones, as well as the fascia that covers the top of the skull, perhaps even the hair and the little tiny muscles that move your hair follicles sometimes if you have a hair raising event. Imagine they're all infused with this golden light so that they can let go and relax. Then imagining this golden light continues to descend. So now it's at the level of the brow and that same level on the back of the head. Relax the brow muscles, the forehead muscles, the muscles of your temples and the sides of your head. And even a little of those muscles and fascia on the back of the skull. You might even feel that the brain begins to relax. Let this light continue to descend now, relaxing the eyebrows and then into the eyeballs. And the muscles of your eyes are relaxing. And at the same time, the bottom of the skull that supports your brain in there is relaxing. It continues down and the nose relaxes and the ears and even those muscles at the base of the skull begin to relax. Feel and imagine this golden light coming into the mouth and the jaw, relaxing those jaw muscles, relaxing the tongue. Moving into the upper part of the neck and the throat. And letting this golden light begin to move down through your throat. Relaxing all the neck muscles. Relaxing the esophagus. Even the tiny little muscles of your voice. And feel and imagine this golden light sort of splits into two or grows and expands into two and fill your shoulders, those big trapezius muscles where the neck meets the shoulders. It helps them begin to relax and then flow into the shoulder joint. And all the big outer muscles of your shoulders, the deltoids and the triceps and such as well as deep inside the small rotator mu muscles, being filled with golden light, gently eased into relaxation. Continuing to flow down through the arms, relaxing those biceps and triceps and the upper arm bone, 
and into the elbow and filling that elbow with gold and radiance that relaxes and warms. Continuing through the forearms, the upper part of the forearm, and then the middle, and then all the way down toward the wrist, filling your wrist with gold and light, then the hand, and the fingers, and the fingertips. Feel and imagine your entire upper arms now relaxed and filled with this gold and light. We'll bring the awareness back toward the neck and shoulders. And now we imagine this golden radiance is flowing down into the torso. And so it relaxes the big muscles of the chest and the muscles of the upper back near your shoulder blades all the muscles of the ribs, and it even flows in and nourishes and cleanses the heart and the lungs. And continuing down through the spine and the breastbone and the entire rib cage, this golden radiance flowing down into the solar plexus area, relaxing your stomach and your liver and your kidneys and everything in there. And then even flowing into your abdomen, relaxing the abdominal muscles, nourishing the abdominal organs, and even your lower spine feeling this golden light flowing into the spine, nourishing, relaxing, repairing. Let it flow all the way down into your pelvis, filling up the pelvic bowl with this sense of a golden radiance, warming, relaxing, nourishing. And then into the hips, this radiance again grows laterally into two, fills up your hips, including your glutes and your sacrum, pubic bone, and begins to flow down into the thighs, the upper thigh with all those thigh muscles and the thigh bones, down through the mid thigh, and the lower end of the thigh, and then into the knees. Feel and imagine your knees filling up with this golden radiance. And smiling down through the upper part of the leg, the lower leg. So feeling those big calf muscles relax and the shin bone relax. And continuing down, the golden light flows down into the mid leg, the lower leg, and into your ankle. Then into the foot. even into the toes and the tips of the toes. Feel and imagine your whole body immersed in this golden radiance. And you might even imagine from the soles of the feet or if you're laying down, you can imagine any part of you that's touching the floor. You can imagine as if gravity is draining out any tension from your body. 
Having relaxed, there's so much space to simply release and let go. And if you're upright, it can flow down out through the bottoms of the feet. Or if you're lying on the floor, it can just flow through any part of you that's touching the earth. And we'll focus a bit on the opposite practice that we began to introduce last time. And so keeping that sense of now being held to the earth, whatever parts of you are touching the chair or the floor, feel the pressure. And like we did before, feel the heaviness, the solidity of that part of you. And then simpler, in this case, than the stupa meditation. If you're lying down, it'll be the whole front of your body. Or if you're sitting, it's sort of like the head and the shoulders and the upper part of the body that are exposed to the air, or you could figuratively think connecting to the sky. And feel into the openness and the spaciousness of that, the lightness. And we'll toggle back to the part of you contacting the earth or your chair or the floor and feel that sense of contact heaviness, density. And then the parts of you that feel in contact with the sky, feel the lightness, the openness, the freedom. And for a moment, see if you can hold both of those at once. Heavy, tangible contact, light, open freedom. and settle back or open your awareness in a way that it feels simple and easy to embrace these two opposites at the same time with no obstruction. As you do, you may find that it's a quick little on-ramp to the sense of being itself. But as you hold these two opposites, it requires or invokes a type of openness of the mind, just a simply spacious aspect that can hold these two things in awareness at once, totally harmoniously. And if you found that, now we shift the foregrounding of our attention to that sense of being. You can feel free to maintain holding those, the sense of the opposites, the sensations. Or if you prefer, you can just let that go and play with this formless meditation of just being with being. But that's how we'll rest for this last portion of our practice.
If your mind wanders, your only task is to bring it back, shifting from thinking and doing into feeling and being. Take note of your mind. If you need to shift back once again into the sense of being itself, or even go back and refresh your sense of those two opposite qualities.
Good, then staying in your posture, just letting go of formal practice. Take a moment just to notice. Hmm. How is my body, breath, and mind? And maybe that was your favorite practice or your least favorite practice. Maybe you thought you did really well or you thought you didn't do very well. Doesn't really matter. All practice is good practice. So we can finish with a sense of gratitude and even perhaps a little bit of accomplishment. It all contributes to our momentum of deepening our wholeheartedness. And so with that sense of dedicated dedication toward deepening wholeheartedness, let's begin to deepen our breath. And invite your mind to float up from any deeply introspective places it may have gone, oh, back toward the more conversational level. When you feel ready, you can raise your gaze, oh, maybe move the body, get comfy. Oh. And we'll just take a few minutes before our lunch break. Mm -hmm. Ah, oh, that was groovy, man. So I needed that. My sleep wasn't excellent last night. And they do say you can make up a bit with yoga nidra. So uh, that was very helpful for me. And I would love to hear any comments or questions. How was that to So yoga nidra, progressive relaxation we've done before. And then today we did that opposite practice as a little on-ramp to just kind of resting in beingness. Any thoughts, questions, or complaints? Yeah, being with being. It's just, it's just the most simple, right? And um, in a lot of traditions, that's actually the most advanced meditation. Um, but sometimes they won't teach you that because for fear that you'll like scoff at its simplicity and then miss out on its profundity later. So often like in Mohamudra and Dzogchen and stuff, they're like, oh no, first you have to do a hundred thousand prostrations. Then you have to do a hundred thousand of these and a hundred thousand of these and a hundred thousand of these. And then you got to breathe through one nostril and then the other. And then they're like, okay, you did all that. Yeah, guru. All right, we'll just sit there and chill, bud. Everything's fine. You're like, everything's fine. You've had me contemplating on suffering for the last 24 years and everything's fine. Uh, but uh, that's why is, is they feel like because it's so simple, we might miss the profundity that's in there. But it's it's quite, quite groovy. Okay, so um, any other questions or thoughts on that practice? Pretty straightforward. All right, so um, we're getting ourselves comfy with choiceless awareness in this practice because then in the afternoon, we'll play a little more with kind of the agency uh, continuum and we'll get into the creative meditation. Like, so there are a couple of practices we'll do about, you know, inspiration and purpose. And then this is a lot of where like the visualization specifically of the energy body, um, this is if we were if we're making our map this is really where that goes of um we of course we've done that all along right we've we did this golden ball yoga nidra at earth element that could be said to be an energy body visualization or we did the little pearl with the water element in the dantian but um, a lot of time where like where that alternate nostril breathing comes from is they're visualizing clearing these psychic channels and stuff and the idea of directing the movement of, of subtle energy in the body with intention is um, it's related to this aspect, the creative aspect that you're not so much trying to like, you know, oh, I got to get the impurities out and I got to move this over here, but you're actually coming from a place of peace and wholeness and going, what can I create in my luminous inner body? What would be epic? Let's make something happen, man. 
Um, so we'll do a little bit of that this afternoon. Okay, no questions, no comments? Well, I guess we're doing great, or you're still in the being, the non-doing. Lao Tzu says, do not doing. So that's, that's, uh, that's the yin side of today's practice, is to do, not doing. And um, it's from non-doing that your doing is most potent. So that's what we're going to get to. All right, it's 12.59 by my clock. We're going to take a 90-minute lunch break. So please come back at 2.30 by my clock. Um, that's Pacific time. So whatever time that is for you uh, in 90 minutes. And I'll see you then. Have a wonderful break.